Hello, and welcome to this London Art Week event. Um, and thank you for joining us. And thank you also to our wonderful museum partner, Strawberry Hill House, for supporting this event. A few words before we start. Um, the talk is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in due course. We'll be taking questions at the end. So if you would like to submit any, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I'll be monitoring that all throughout the talk. Uh, my name is Emanuela Tarizzo. I am Gallery Director at Tommaso Brothers Fine Art, and I'm joined today by three brilliant speakers. Laura Engel is Professor of English at Duquesne University in Pennsylvania. She specializes in 18th century British literature with a focus on drama and theater history, gender studies, um, performance theory, and material culture. Last year, she co-curated the exhibition uh, Artful Nature, Fashion and Theatricality from 1770 to 1830 at the Lewis Walpole Library in Farmington. And the exhibition is now online. So towards the end of the talk, I will be popping that link and some others that we might be mentioning on the in the chat box so that you can have a look and look at the, the various exhibits and insights from the exhibition. Judith Hawley is Professor of English at Royal Holloway and also specializes in English British uh, in uh, British 18th century literature and culture, particularly in groups and coteries such as the Blue Stockings and the Scriblarians, and in the history of private theatricals in the long 19th century, which is a subject we're going to hear more about um, in a minute. You may be familiar with her from episodes of BBC Radio Force program In Our Time, uh, in which, amongst other things, she discusses the history and social impact of coffee and the 18th century gin craze. And I highly recommend listening to the podcast. And Cynthia Roman is curator of prints, drawings, and paintings at the Lewis Walpole Library in Farmington, Connecticut, which is part of Yale University Library, and is a unique resource for the study of Walpoleana and of British 18th century studies more widely. Cindy co-curated the wonderful 2010 exhibition Horace Walpole and Strawberry Hill, which was at the Yale Center for British Arts and at the V&A Museum in London. And more recently, she organized a stage reading of Walpole's play, The Mysterious Mother, which we're going to hear about, uh, at the Yale Center for British Arts. And Judith actually took part um, in the same reading and the conference that followed. So as you know, Today, uh, we're going to be looking at the female theatricals, the female artists, actresses, and playwrights of Strawberry Hill Theatricals. And before we begin, uh, we thought I would just give you a brief, um, brief biographical sketches, so to speak, of the four main protagonists um, of our discussion today. So we're obviously going to start uh, with Robert Walpole, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with. He was the son of Robert Walpole, uh, the first Lord of the Treasury and effectively the first Prime Minister of Great Britain, so a highly influential figure. Uh, like his father, he was a Whig Member of Parliament, um, but he did not inherit uh, his father Robert's passion for politics. He was, however, incredibly passionate about a number of other things. Um, you all know him, I'm sure, as the author of The Castle of Otranto, the first Gothic novel and as the builder of Strawberry Hill, which you can actually see in this painting, in this 1754 painting by Eckert in the background. It's obviously the, the White House that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, Walpole, um, like many of young men of, of, of birth, of rank um, and of means, uh, went on the Grand Tour to France, Switzerland and Italy between 1739 and 1741. He returned and having started amassing what would become a fantastic uh, and immense collection of objects, uh, books and prints and drawings, um, he purchased the location of, future, of the future Strawberry Hill House um, in, in 1747 and began uh, building shortly afterwards. It's interesting, uh, I think, to note in this context that he created a Strawberry Hill committee together with an amateur architect and an artist who with him designed the house. And um, I mentioned the Castle of Otranto. He was obviously also the author of The Mysterious Mother, which he wrote in 1768. Um, and it's the play that we're going to hear more about uh, today. He was also the patron of Lady Diana Buckler. He was the godfather and later patron of Anne Seymour Damer. Um, and he first met Mary Berry and her family in 1788 and quickly became a, a very close friend and benefactor of the family. Now, I mentioned these three women because they are our three protagonists together with Walpole. Um, so starting with um, 
moving on to Diana Buckler, just in chronological order, she was born Lady Diana Spencer, the third daughter of the Duke of Marlborough, and in her lifetime, like her 20th century namesake, she was known as Lady Di. Uh, you see her here in a painting by Joshua Reynolds, uh, who was a family friend, and he said to have played a role in helping her develop an interest in drawing, which would actually become her profession later in life. Um, she married in 1757, second Viscount uh, Bolingbroke, Bolingbroke, forgive me, um, who was notoriously unfaithful um, to her, and the marriage is said to have a very uh, said to have been a very unhappy one. They had two sons, uh, but it's interesting that uh, it was actually uh, her husband who petitioned to dissolve the, the marriage uh, on the grounds of her adultery. And two days after this petition was granted, she married her, her then lover and later second husband, Topham Buckler. Um, he was an interesting character. Um, he was very well connected. He was the son of an MP um, and um, he was a friend of Dr. Johnson, part of his uh, literary club. He was a collector, he was a bibliophile, had a fantastic library, and he was also an amateur chemist, we're told. Uh, but we're also told that he had a terrible temperament, he was addicted to laudanum, and uh, he had abysmal personal hygiene, apparently. He, he said to have infested the entire Blenheim Palace with lice on the occasion of one party. Um, but, um, and also this marriage too was said to be unhappy. So um, sadly, or luckily for Diana, he died, uh, Tom died in 1780, which means that she lived another 20 years, almost 20 years. Um, she remained um, unmarried and she dedicated herself to her work, uh, which was mainly uh, in pen and ink, pastel and watercolors. She illustrated, as we're going to see, uh, Walpole's play, The Mysterious Mother and also other literary works. And from about 1783, she also worked for Wedgwood, designing, um, creating designs for Wedgwood ware, the pottery and bone china and fine porcelain, uh, which were actually very successful. And um, I'm gonna now move on to the second um, artist that uh, Walpole was a patron of that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and Dama, you may be familiar with her because we um, had a, a seminar dedicated to her back in October about her work as a sculptor. So if you want to go, go back to that, if you're interested in her, it's available on our YouTube channel. Um, she was a daughter of Henry Seymour Conway, who was a close friend of, of Walpole and actually a cousin. Uh, Walpole was her godfather. She spent a lot, a lot of time with him as, as she was growing up and even later in life. Um, and what's interesting, perhaps as a biographical um, aspect uh, to Andema to this talk, is that her sister, uh, her half-sister and a brother-in-law were the Duke and Duchess of Richmond who were famous for hosting private theatricals uh, at their house in London, Richmond House. And, and Anne often participated as an actress. Um, she also married, she, she also had a, a rather unhappy marriage which ended uh, after they separated, it ended with her husband's suicide um, in a tavern in Covent Garden. Um, he'd amassed huge gambling debts um, which Anne actually apparently managed to repay. Um, and then she, after this, this period, it's, it's after um, the death of her husband that she seems to really concentrate on her work as an artist, as a sculptor. And what's quite unusual for a woman of, a, of her time is that she goes beyond the sort of usual wax modeling and takes lessons in anatomy, modeling and carving and works mostly marble, um, also having bronze, uh, bronze sculptors cast and she, uh, often exhibited the Royal Academy as an honorary exhibitor. She traveled to Europe extensively on several occasions, uh, sometimes on her own, which was impressive. She met Napoleon and his wife in 1802 in, in Paris uh, during the period of the Peace of Amiens. So she was a very fascinating um, character. And in um, 1789, she meets Mary and Agnes Berry and their father, thanks to Walpole. Um, and this is obviously very important to the story we're about to tell. Um, and when Walpole died, Anne became his executor, his residuary legatee, and she became the life tenant of Strawberry Hill, where she would continue the tradition of private theatricals, uh, as we're going to see. But now on to my last um, protagonist, uh, Mary Berry. She was the daughter of Robert Berry and sister of Agnes Berry, who was only one year her junior. 
Um, their mother died in childbirth when Mary was a toddler, uh, so they were brought up by uh, the, their maternal grandmother and then um, went on to a boarding school in Chiswick for their education. In May 1783, the Berry sisters and their fathers were reunited and they embarked on the first of many grand tours to the continent. And Mary began keeping a journal, which tells us a lot about her life and is a fantastic resource. Um, just a quick word about her family. Um, her father was the nephew of a wealthy merchant from Scotland, did not, uh, the, he was not the, the heir of this wealthy merchant, but they received um, an annuity and they were left a legacy in his will and then continued to receive an annuity by, from his heir. So they, they weren't wealthy, but they, they had an income. They, they came, this is just to sort of place them uh, within the social circles of the period. Um, in 1788, after they come back from the first grand tour, uh, they take a house at Twickenham Common, and this is where they meet Walpole and later Andamer, as I was saying. It's interesting that both um, the Berry sisters were artists as well. They, they both sketched, and but Mary obviously is mostly remembered as a writer. Walpole certainly admired both of them for their intelligence and their achievements, um, which is um, and a testimony of this is the fact that Walpole named her, Mary, uh, his literary executor. She published five volumes of his works and later four volumes of the letters of uh, Madame du Défant to Walpole in 18, 1810. Uh, but she also later in life became a writer, um, was known as writer in her own right, uh, particularly for two works on comparative views of the social life in England and France from the Restoration to the Revolution of 1830. Uh, fashionable, the Fashionable Friends is her only play to have been performed on stage, and her journals and correspondence were published posthumously in 1865. Um, I hope this has given you a, a brief and not too long outline of the protagonists. And now um, I think we can move on to the questions and open, if I may, with Judith. Um, and if you could introduce us to the custom of private theatricals in Georgian England. And were they as private as the term suggests? And also, what was Walpole's contribution to this tradition? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Absolutely classic mistake, isn't it? I'm going to have a T-shirt printed, you're on mute. Um, so private theatricals were uh, part of the sort of longer history of amateur performance in Britain that you might trace from, say, the, the medieval mystery plays through to amateur clubs, amateur theatre clubs meeting in church halls in, in our era. But they're a very particular moment in that history. Um, they're private in the sense that they were not open to the public. Uh, the, the privacy was, was controlled by the issuing of, of invitations and tickets, but they were very sought after invitations because these plays were put on largely by the elite. Now, there are some fairly uh, low-key private theatricals. Uh, Jane Austen's family performed in their barn at Steventon. Um, you might roll up the carpet in the, in, the, in the parlor and put on a little show, but very often they're put on by uh, really the, 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 the bon ton, the, the, the elite of society, sometimes in purpose-built theatres. So the, um, uh, the Barrymore um, had uh, a, a fantastic theatre at, at Wargrave that bankrupted him. He, 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 when he sold uh, Earl of Barrymore, he sold his theatre and uh, the set was bought by a professional theatre. It was so grand. Um, Elizabeth Craven, the Margravine of Ansbach, had a theatre built for herself at Brandenburg House in Hammersmith. And one of the, the features of private theatricals is that women could be much more involved than they could be on the professional stage. So um, the Margravine was a, an impresario. She staged the performances, she staged managed them, she wrote most of the plays, she performed in them, she starred in them for 30, 40 years. So these are, sometimes they were just a little thing put on once for the holidays. But th some theatricals like the Brandenburg House theatricals or Anne Damer's theatricals were kind of a lifetime interest that people had almost careers in non-professional performance. What we're looking at here is um, a pamphlet, the front page of the pamphlet, which prints the prologue and epilogue to a play that was performed at Richmond House. And Emanuela has already told us how um, Damer was sister-in-law to the Duke of Richmond. And the Duke of Richmond, who's a very important politician, had a, a little theatre built inside his house in, uh, in Whitehall in the Privy, um, Privy Garden. So really at the centre of power. 
Walpole's involvement was, was several fold. He is a great chronicler of these private theatricals, his amazing correspondence, which is such a rich resource in, in so many ways, details lots of occasions in which he attended private theatricals. He also often wrote prologues and epilogues for his friends. And he was um, a great uh, sort of student of the theatre, both the professional and the non I'm, not, I'm trying not to use the term amateur. I'm carefully steering away from amateur because it has such complicated associations. And, and the, the association between AM, you know, or the sort of the bad reputation, the unfairly bad reputation that Palm Dram has now, I think would give us a false impression of what these things were like. But anyway, he, he collected information about um, both professional performances and these private theatricals and housed them together in his scrapbooks and, and collections. He sort of in some ways didn't distinguish between them. And one of the ways in which private theatricals weren't really private is that they were covered in the press. Lots of people wanted a few paragraphs in the press. And you'll see that the London newspapers underneath the listings for the two main private, uh, two main um, public theatres, the uh, Theatre Royal at, at Drury Lane and Covent Garden, it would say what was on at, at Covent Garden. And then immediately under it, it would list what Lady So-and-so was, was performing in her house. And not only it would list um, the, the, the bill for that evening, it would say who was performing in it, it would have the dramatist persona, and not only that, it would tell you who was attending it. So you'd have the, the paparazzi of the day, um, standing around outside the door, watching the uh, the carriages arrive and noting down who attended. And one of the fascinating things about private theatricals is that the audience and the performers are drawn from the same so social set. So they're seeing a sort of mirror image of themselves in a, in a way. Um, and part of the pleasure is seeing your cousin, your aunt, your uncle, your your sister-in-law performing a role and there's an effect of the kind of pentimento of the the original character showing through the the role that they're performing and there being a little sort of frisson um when you when you see this character being being performed and this and the richmond house theatricals were particularly um exciting and here's a wonderful picture so let's let's go to this uh slide here so i said that they were um covered in the press and here is um a cartoon a kind of caricature of the way to keep him, we saw the, the prologue and epilogue a moment ago, with um, Anne Damer and Albinia um, Hobart, the Countess of Buckinghamshire. Um, and this, this idea of the mirror image, there's, there's the motto at the top of, of the sort of, what would be a sort of kind of proscenium march, velute and speculum, there's, as in a mirror, there's a reflection of the, uh, the, the lives of, of the, uh, the performers in the characterization. Part of the appeal for Hogarth is that um, he felt that the professional theatre was vulgar. The acting was histrionic because the uh, professional theatres had greatly increased in size. So uh, Drury Lane housed about 3,600 people when it was rebuilt in the, in the 1790s. It's this vast auditorium. The acting became histrionic. The shows became spectacular. And what he liked was something that was small, intimate and genteel. It was either written by the genteel or performed by the genteel where they could actually sort of be themselves in the roles. It wasn't some lower class person putting on an accent. He, he, he felt there was a sort of authenticity in it. But as this cartoon shows, by it, it's by um, uh, Bunbury, who was himself an amateur artist. Uh, it's, it's pretty fake. It's, it's no more um, authentic than, than any other kind of performance. And Walpole was at this event and gives us a very good account of it. So after he died and his um, his house went to Anne Damer, Anne Damer, who'd performed in the Strawberry Hill, sorry, in the Richmond House theatricals, also was associated with uh, the Margaretine of Ansbach's theatricals, put on her own shows at, at, at Strawberry Hills Theatre. Um, and we have evidence of maybe three or four um, night's performances or, or productions that she put on at Strawberry Hill. One of them is The Old Maid and the Intriguing Chambermaid. And we think that they were probably performed in the old parlour or refectory, the eating room, which probably only really seated 40 people comfortably, but often had 70 people seated uncomfortably. There are accounts from Elizabeth Harvey, uh, the novelist and friend of, of Damer and the Berries, that people were crammed in 
and the first night's performances, as were very often the case with private theatricals, were put on to the locals, the vulgar, and they were crammed in 70 apiece, and then you'd have other performances, uh, which, were, which were rather more elegant. Let's look at the, the next slide. And we have um, the, the playbill for Fashionable Friends, the, the play which we'll talk more about in a moment. And it's, it's, it's interesting to note that these are, are private theatricals, but they're imitating the professional stage, even to the extent of this sort of para-theatrical um, print ephemera. You get lots and lots of, of playbills and, and, and tickets and things like that. Elizabeth Harvey was, was delighted by the production of um, Fashionable Friends in many ways, but was really concerned, first of all, that um, uh, Dama was, her voice was dreary. And then she's, and, and she loved the costumes, but she was very worried that uh, the plot of Fashionable Friends would lead to gossip about the relationship between Dama and the Berries. Well, that's a, a fascinating point. And, and I think maybe we can come back to that um, in a minute when we look at Fashionable Friends, but, um, if you wanted to talk us through this beautiful yeah. um, slide of today. One, one last, yeah, one last image here is that uh, there's a sign of Damer's kind of commitment to um, private theatricals. It's almost, almost an amateur career in a way, but she had a, a prompt book where she bound up copies of the plays that she had performed and prepared for performance. And this is a performance of The Devil to Pay. And this is the dramatist persona I tipped in. And the, and the production has been, as you would with a, a professional prompt book, scenes are, are cut out and you know, there's a lot of rewriting. And there's one minor character, a blind fiddler, who just appears a couple of times in the, um, in the, in the performance. And Dama keeps crossing out blind or crossing out the character and eventually she almost takes him out altogether, all references to his blindness. Um, and one of, the, I think there's a real, um, maybe a sort of a triggering in this word because her husband who Emanuela um, mentioned earlier committed suicide in, in, a, in a kind of brothel in Covent Garden, did it with a blind fiddler as a witness. So this was just too close to the bone, I think. And that, that closeness, the intimacy of private theatricals is, is part of that, that free song and the, the effect of performance. That's incredible. I mean, wow. <laughs> and yeah, you can see why she would have wanted to, to cross it out and it would have been problematic for her to see this reminder. Um, now, going back to, to Horace Walpole, Cindy, can you, oh, and actually we, we actually have yeah. this last slide before we go on to Horace Walpole and his mysterious mother. Um, it's just a very brief mention. This is a, 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 a drawing of what we think of the set designs for one of the Strawberry Hill productions. And uh, there's a volume of about 12 of them and um, Agnes Berry is supposed to have worked on them. Um, this is a copy by someone else, but you get the, the sense that they're really trying hard to turn their home into a theater. Absolutely. So, um, Cindy, uh, we, there we are with the, the Mysterious Mother. Um, here you can see the, the title page and the front flyleaf with Walpole's own um, manuscript handwriting. Um, so can you tell us what, what's the story with The Mysterious Mother? All right. Um, so, of course, this is the, the copy um, of Walpole's um, mysterious play that he kept in um, next to the display of the drawings at Strawberry Hill uh, for people that needed um, some explanation. So um, Walpole's The Mysterious Mother is um, a dark tragedy. It is emotionally charged with unbounded crimes and psychological anguish. Uh, the title character is a defiant, willful woman who rules an inherited estate against um, patrimonial protocols. Um, and the plot weaves intrigue and deceit, conniving Catholic clergy, and the horrors of a double incest, uh, confounding maternal behavior, um, passionate struggles of guilt and penitence, and religious superstition against secular reason. So this agreeable, disagreeable story, as Walpole describes it, unfolds in a distant time and place, that of Catholic France in the Middle Ages. The Countess, a pious widow, lives reclusively at the, at the castle of Narbonne. And she is a benefactor of the abbey and the orphanage. And she gives alms to the poor. 
The castle, however, is shrouded in mystery and sadness of unspeakable domestic woes. The countess, oops, is, uh, sorry. Um, the castle is shrouded in mystery and unspeakable woes. Her husband was lost in the Crusades and the countess has banished her son Edmund, uh, now Count of Narbonne, ostensibly for a tryst with her maid Beatrice. But more is revealed as the family horror builds. The tragedy opens with Edmund who returns from the Crusades to his ancestral home after a 16 year exile um, with no contact with his mother during that time, but for the money that she sends to him. Edmund is accompanied by Florian, his friend and fellow soldier, uh, who often acts as a seer or commentator on the story. As the family is reunited, dark secrets come to light, abetted by the torment of the friars Benedict and his sidekick Martin, who conspire to discover her guilty secrets and extract from her confession of her sins um, for their own gain. She proves a formidable challenge, um, swayed by super, not swayed by superstition or religion. And Edmund, um, when she returns, meets and falls in love with the Countess's ward, Adeliza. Uh, the Countess, misunderstanding the proposed union presented by Florian, thinks that it is Florian who loves Adeliza. Um, meanwhile, beginning to suspect the cause of the Countess's guilt, Father Benedict and Martin enact a vengeful triumph over the Countess by hastily marrying the innocent Adeliza to the unwitting Edmund. So, uh, Edmund and Eliza then visit the Countess uh, for her blessing on their marriage, and this drives her it to the confession that Benedict has been trying to extract for years. In her mad grief and longing for her dead husband, the Countess has disguised herself as the maid Beatrice and placed herself in her son's bed. At Eliza, the ward is the offspring of this union, resulting in this lifetime of alienation and guilt. Uh, and the revelation of this original incest secret, now a double incest plot in the union of the father brother with the sister daughter, um, precipitously shatters all their lives um, and devastates the, the family lineage. Thank you, Cindy, for that uh, fantastic um, summary of the rather complex story. And uh, back to you, Judith, uh, we know that the mysterious mother was never performed in a public theater. Um, and Wolfram himself during his lifetime, and I have the longer quote here, um, said that it was not fit for the stage. What did he mean by that? And why did he say that? You're, you're mute. Never learn. It's, it's partly that uh, this story is really shocking. I mean, triple suicide, double incest. Um, though there were other plays about incest and suicide performing in the public theater. Um, I think it was largely because he felt that the actors would mangle it. They were, they were, they were not genteel enough. They wouldn't treat it seriously enough. And he had a real um, grievance against uh, actor managers such as Garrick, because he felt that they were really in, in hock to the box office, that they, they did things to please the vulgar audiences and they, they wouldn't catch the kind of the true taste as he saw it of his play. Thank you. And so, Cindy, I think we can now go a bit more into the detail, uh, into the details of these drawings that I mentioned Diana Beauclair executed for the play. Um, we have on screen part of the description uh, that Wolfgang himself wrote. And do you want to, as, do you want to talk us through it? Um, so in 1776, um, Walpole builds um, a special room, um, a tower, uh, in order, it's designed by Mr. Essex in order to display the drawings at Strawberry Hill. And yes, the somebody is, point, is pointing at the uh, exterior view yeah. of the north side of Strawberry Hill, and that is the uh, the turreted tower. Um, and then it is in this floor plan. It's the small little space, um, number G, if you can read it um, there. Yes. Um, so it is a very small um, little space and private in its way. Um, but I wanted to say that first, um, commission um, is a tricky word in the context of Lady Diana Beauclark's drawing um, artwork, even though uh, Walpole did patronize her. Um, I think commission implies a contractual agreement of a professional artist and patron. Um, and Lady Diana Beauclark and Horace Walpole both would be eager to keep such associations at a distance. 
Um, rather, Walpole's insistent efforts to limit the circulation of the play are similar. Um, among a small circle of friends, parallels the illustration of his plays by someone in his own social circle, or as Judith was just talking about, um, performances by people that you know and that are, are part of your are very sort of um, close social um, group. Um, so Lady Diana Bocock is a friend of Horace Walpole's. She is a woman from the nobility, as we learned. Um, and she does get training from, you know, one of the best um, academic artists um, of the time in uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds. Um, but I don't think she would want to be considered a professionally trained artist. Um, it is this non-professional status that makes her capacity as an artist especially compelling for Walpole. Um, her noble status grants her sort of aesthetic capacity, superior to commercially based professional artists, um, artists just as amateur actors um, perform with knowing expression that professionals just cannot be privy to. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons why Walpole lavishly celebrates um, Bocarc's mysterious mother drawings in this purpose built closet and fits that into the story that he tells in his house um, about the history of art, about the lineage of his family um, and British history. Um, we're going to look at, I think you should all see the slide, uh, three of the drawings. Cindy, would you like us to, would you like to tell us? Yeah. Um, so we can fill in a little bit of the action and, and the plot um, here. Um, we have six drawings at uh, the Lewis Walpole Library. Um, but I should say that Walpole uh, records that he had seven drawings. So one is missing. Um, if it would be fabulous if it ever shows up, but I always like to, to speculate about what is missing and, and whether or not there's a, a reason for that. Um, so the first one um, that we see at the top left is from act two, scene two, where Edmund and Florian um, arrive to see the procession of um, orphans with Father Benedict um, overseeing them and sort of peering from the doorway. And this is the one that Walpole describes, the beauty and grace of the figures and of the children are inimitable. In the scene of the children, some are evidently vulgar, others children of rank. Um, and the first child that pretends to look down and does leer up is charming. Um, I think I will let you read the uh, commentaries yourselves to, to save time here, but I think they're sort of important to understand what it is that uh, Walpole sees um, as so wonderful in these drawings. So the next one in the middle is act two, scene three, sorry, where the Countess of Bone is with uh, Peter the Porter. Um, and uh, this is where the, she talks of her wretched state. He tells her of uh, strange visitors who come inquiring. Um, she proclaims that she does not fear storms or goblins against uh, Peter's sort of superstitions. Um, and then the last one here is Act 3, Scene 3, where the Countess of Narbonne are, uh, first meets Edmund, who she, her son, who she it, thinks is a hallucination of her, her dead husband, while Friar Benedict kind of lurks in the background, kind of trying to figure out what the secret and the, uh, what's going on. So he can use it to his advantage. And we have more friars lurking. So right. <laughs> so um, again, on the left we see Friar Benedict and Friar Martin, who um, are again conspiring and conniving about how they're going to get at the secret that the Countess keeps so close, um, and to get her to confess. Um, in the center is uh, the Countess of Narbonne and uh, Adeliza, her ward. Um, who, you know, is confused about why she's held at um, arm's length. And finally, the last scene um, where Walpole describes the tenderness, despair, and resolution of the Countess in the last scene, um, which is a stroke of double passion in Edmund, um, where he um, both has uh, clenched his hand and is ready to strike and holds um, the left hand uh, relents. Um, so here the Countess just realizing um, what has happened and the double incest that has occurred is tormented um, and takes her own life. Um, she commits suicide with a dagger. Edmund vows to return to the Crusades um, and Adeliza retreats to a convent. 
Um, and just to say quickly that when uh, in his descriptions, Walpole underscores the use of gesture and expression, which alludes to the way in which he compares these things to academic history painting, um, in which these kinds of um, ways of telling a story or a narrative are of, of the utmost importance. And um, I think we can, if you want to briefly say, uh, obviously we see here the drawings when they were exhibited uh, most recently at Strawberry Hill in the room in, in, in the closet that was created for them originally. Um, and also a bit about how they were displayed. And then I think we can go back again <laughs> briefly um, for a question of time to their appreciation by, by Walpole. Okay. so. Um... Again, they were displayed in this rather small um, little space, which was very private. Not a lot of people could fit into it at one time. They were displayed in black and gold frames, and sadly not the ones that are on the wall. Those are modern frames that we put them in for the loan. Um, uh, a copy of the play was kept in a desk that was also commissioned. It was bound in blue leather and gilt and kept in the drawer. There was a stained glass with the shield of Diana Beauclark. And there was a reduced copy of Reynolds' portrait that um, Emanuela started with. And here, a reduced copy um, by John Powell of uh, Diana Beauclark as an, as an artist. Um, artist with a small A, I guess, not largest, not artist with a big A um, in, in this professional sense. And uh, there's also an interesting quote from Mary Hamilton, I think, which tells us that he was only showing this closet to certain guests, wasn't he? So it was a kind exactly. of special so in, occasion. So it was something of a, of a private uh, performance or spectacle. Um, if you were invited into this room, um, maybe again, parallel with being invited to a private theatrical um, yes. performance. Uh, and, and he only printed 50 copies of the play as well originally. So that he controlled the circulation as well. And I have here on screen some other works by uh, Lady Di. If you wanted to, to tell us, you know, there's an example of her work for Wedwood, a drawing, another Strawberry Hill um, work. Right. So um, on the left is a cabinet on stand, um, which was commissioned um, from. Uh, Horace Wal by Horace Walpole from Edward Edwards um, to display some of these drawings by Lady Diana Beauclark. It's now in Farmington with us. It's one of our sort of treasures or bits of the True Cross as Mr. Lewis used to refer to these things from Strawberry Hill. Um, on the sides, which you can't see, are drawings for uh, Wedgwood flower tubs, um, which were listed as among the principal curiosities for Walpole. And he did commission Wedgwood to make, I think, just one pair of these. Um, and they were discovered, I think, by Michael Snowden and um, displayed in the um, earlier Strawberry Hill um, exhibit. Um, many of these are sort of little, uh, charming little children and gypsies and things like that, as well as the center drawing um, from Princeton University. Uh, it is very nice to say that Lady Diana Bocart's drawings are in other collections besides the Lewis Walpole Library or maybe Strawberry Hill. Um, again, it's that um, composition of, of charming children in, um, you know, wash and pen. Yes. Um, and also did um, provide designs for Wedgwood, as you said. And so um, she did work for pay, um, even though we might think of her as not a professional artist, but it's that that sort of class distinction divide um, as as Judith wanted to avoid amateur, um, so do I, because the term just um, doesn't translate um, the way it does for us today. So it doesn't have so much that pejorative, um, but the fact that you work not so much for um, commercial gain or monetary gain. Thank you. <laughs> And here we have uh, two other examples of a work. I don't know if you, if Laura, you want to come in um, and tell us a little bit about these two illustrations, which are for different literary works, but again, by Lady Di. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to talk very briefly about these. Um, these are, are an interesting example, I think, of Lainey Dye, uh, Diana Bilkirk, um, really actually wanting people to, to see her work, um, even if she didn't uh, want to be an artist with a capital A um, because of the associations um, uh, associated with being a professional artist. Um, I think she did paint and uh, illustrate works uh, so that people could see them. Um, the, uh, the, the one on, the, um, on my right uh, is a, a drawing from her series on the Fairy Queen. It's a watercolor, a series of watercolors, and they're beautiful. They're very theatrical. Um, this is the scene uh, from Busserine's uh, castle uh, where uh, Britomart comes to save Amaret. Um, and the backdrop, uh, the sort of design of the backdrop is very much taken from um, pieces of, of Strawberry Hill, of Walpole Strawberry Hill. So she's really thinking theatrically about the house. Um, and then the other drawing is for uh, Leonora, a very, uh, a very popular Gothic uh, poem uh, later on in the century. And she was very well known for, uh, for these illustrations. Um, and she was really uh, very productive after, as you mentioned, the, the death of her um, unpleasant husband. Second unpleasant husband. Second unpleasant husband, yeah. husband. bad track record. But yeah, unfortunate. But um, and um, I wanted to, to sort of finish this section on, on Lizzie Dye with this quote. And maybe um, we've already discussed a bit about the, the, the notion of professional as opposed to amateur or why amateur is not such a good word, actually. Um, I think it's fantastic that Horace Walpole, writing to his friend, Reverend William Mason in 1776, the um, says about the drawings and he's talking about Gibbon's history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire which is a, an absolute uh, magnum opus of several volumes um, and he says do I know nothing superior to Mr Gibbon yes I talk of great original genius Lady Di Beauclair has made seven large drawings in soot water for scenes of my mysterious mother the ones we've just seen Oh, such drawings, Guido's grace, Albano's children, Poussin's expression, Salvatore's boldness in landscape and Andrea Sacchi's simplicity of composition might perhaps have equaled them had they wrought together all very fine. So, Cindy, um, maybe in explaining to us what he means, why he's saying this, you can tell us a bit about uh, the idea of the female genius, uh, Walpole's female geniuses. Sure. So um, it, it is, of course, hyperbole. Um, and Walpole engages very much in this dialogue with um, the sort of academic um, understanding of art history and the narrative of what a great artist should be. Um, and so we might not actually um, think of these things as, um, as great history paintings that are could rival Guido Reni or um, Nicolas Poussin or Salvatore Rosa, um, but it's a very deliberate um, comparison that he's making. And again, this idea that they're not artists, um, and that um, that she um, didn't quite labor the way an academic artist would. And the the reference to Gibbons. Um, also, as a model for um, academic history painters, um, is also very um, important. Um, and so her work um, is, again, um, included in lists of Walpole's at Strawberry Hill, works of genius by persons of rank and gentlemen, not artists. Again, he's very clear to define that. Um, also included in, in lists of principal curiosities along um, masterpieces of painting like Van Dyck, Lily, and Poussin. Um, and um, so these uh, kinds of hyperboles are just underscore and, and, and feed the argument of all close critical views about the history of art and points of quality that he values. And I think that the fact that he's, you know, uh, he's talking about uh, works of genius and he did um, call cool uh, Lady Di a genius, but he was also, he also referred to Andema as a genius, and um, I think we, I want to uh, move on to Andema and Mary Berry. Um, you see them both here uh, on the screen in their youth. Um, Laura, uh, we, we've heard about how Anne 
inherited Strawberry Hill effectively uh, for her lifetime and continued the tradition of private theatricals there. And it is at Strawberry Hill that her friend Mary Berry uh, stages, uh, thanks to Anne and with her help, the fashionable friends in 1801. Uh, what's the plot? What's the story? Um, well, we have we don't have a lot of information about how Mary Berry came to write the play Fashionable Friends. We have no diaries or letters that describe the process, but we do have the script and we have a copy of the cast list in the playbill. Um, it, she, Mary Berry, starred uh, in this play as the uh, lovely and sentimental Mrs. Lovell. Um, and she, the play is about her friendship with the cosmopolitan, uh, fashionable Lady Selena Vapor, who was played by Ann Damer. Um, and their friendship uh, plays out in the play um, with uh, very much like a restoration comedy alongside the intrigues of several couples. Um, the cast features um, Sir Dudley Dormont, a classic rake who's in love, who's in love with Selena, um, but plotting to marry the very silly heiress, Miss Rackett. Uh, Mrs. Rackett, uh, Miss Rackett's mother, who is modeled after Lady Wishfort in uh, Congreve's um, Way of the World. Um, and uh, also has some of the best lines in the play. Um, Sir Valentine, who is the patriarch of the play, who um, pontificates a lot and uh, dabbles in new scientific uh, technologies. And Mr. Lovell, uh, the feckless husband of um, Mrs. Lovell, who has also had a past with Lady Selena, um, but in the end uh, finds himself again in love with his wife. Um, the end of the play uh, is, is a giant masquerade where all of uh, Lady Selena's intrigues are revealed um, and um, everyone ends up with their designated match except for Lady Selena, who is ostracized and alone at the end of the play. Thank you, that was great. Yeah. Um, and um, we have actually uh, here, we put a slide with Mary Berry's, a drawing by Mary Berry, just to show that she was artistic and if you, it comes in, into the, uh, it's into the play's plot, the idea of women and their sketching lessons, their, their yeah, I mean, one of the, the funny things about the idea of fashionable, I mean, fashionable in the title makes fun of, you know, dress and accessories and, uh, you know, mingling with elite society and also the fact that there, this is the elite society putting on the private theatrical as, as Judith uh, described. Um, but it also makes fun very particularly of the idea of women's education, of uh, fashionable education for women being, uh, you know, drawing, singing and playing musical instruments. Um, and in one of the funniest lines in the play, um, Mrs. Rackett is talking about her daughter who is Miss Rackett, who is no brain trust, but has published several poems and has had many of her drawings engraved. And Mr. Valentine says, uh, you know, well, isn't some, aren't people jealous of your daughter? And Miss Rackett remarks, everybody is accomplished now. Everybody paints and sings and plays and is ingenious. Um, which is very funny, but they're also, you know, uh, Ann Damer, Mary Berry, Agnes Berry, all of these women were incredibly accomplished. Agnes Berry was decorating the set. She was making the sets for these private theatricals and acting in them. She was Miss Rackett. Uh, Mary Berry was uh, writing and also drawing, as you see this lovely drawing. And Ann Damer worked on multiple different uh, artistic genres. So they're making fun of themselves here. Absolutely. And talking about uh, Anne Damer's artist, the, the various artistic genres in which she worked, uh, was there a connection between her activity as an actress um, and her identity as an artist? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is a beautiful bust that she made of Eliza Farron as Thalia the Comic Muse. Um, and uh, th then there's a print of the bust as well, which really uh, suggests that this image was circulating. Um, and that was, a, there was a sort of afterlife of this image beyond the actual artwork itself. Um, Damer was clearly very inspired by actresses. She was inspired by Farron. Um, she also uh, made a bust of Sarah Siddons and taught Sarah Siddons how to sculpt. Sarah Siddons did make sculpture, which is fascinating uh, in and of itself. Um, but the other thing that's really compelling about Ann Damer is that apparently she decorated the stages of her performances with her artwork. Um, so she was in some ways a kind of 18th century performance artist um, and, you know, sort of performing along with her own, um, her own artworks on stage, uh, which is really, really fascinating. Um, and I, go ahead. Oh, go on. No, I just, I think it's really interesting to think about the idea of Farron herself 
uh, watching the Richmond House private theatricals, which she directed, and seeing a bust of herself on stage and the sort of juxtaposition between the idea that sculpture is memorial and lasting and a tangible object that we still have now, but all of the performances of these actresses are now lost to us. So what we have left is the, the art, art and artifact. And in terms of, you've mentioned this dialogue between the theatre and, and sculpture, and uh, did it apply more broadly at the time, would you say, into other, and actually, uh, yeah, uh, we're here. Okay, can we go back to the slide yes, before? Yes, we, we will, absolutely. One second. Okay, so this slide is really interesting. This is um, two depictions of uh, Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. Uh, one is uh, Eliza, Sophie is Eliza Farron uh, coming, her, uh, as Hermione coming to life, and the other is William Hamilton's painting for Boydell's Shakespeare Gallery, also of Hermione coming to life. Um, and that may have been inspired by Sarah Siddons' performance of Hermione. This play was very popular at the end of the 18th century, I think partially because it's such a incredible theatrical feat for an actress to believably act as a statue and then come to life. And apparently audiences really appreciated this kind of transformation. But also what's interesting about this is it, it signals um, Ovid's Pygmalion myth, the idea of the um, male artist, creative genius, creating an ideal female artwork and then breathing life into it. But when you think about the uh, practice of female artists and female actresses, um, the, the idea of the gender trajectory of the Pygmalion myth gets um, disrupted. It, right, so um, Anne Damer making a bust of Eliza Farron, Anne Damer bringing Mary Berry's play to life. Uh, she is acting as a as a female Pygmalion and changing this kind of legacy. Thank you. And so let's go back to this slide. Um, as you rightly said, it's very important. Um, what can you tell us about these two paintings? I love these. I, I love this image of of uh, Anne Damer. It seems to me to be an unusual image. It's by Harriet Carr, um, and it's an image of her in her youth, and she appears to be dancing or doing something quite theatrical, and she looks gorgeous. Um, Anne Damer herself was known uh, for her costumes uh, and for her jewelry. Um, it, people wrote extensively about what she wore in private theatricals. And I'm just going to quote uh, a writer for the Gentleman's Magazine, uh, described her dress for the Richmond House private theatrical as a white robe with embroidered gauze worn with a diamond necklace of prodigious value, ornaments of diamonds in her hair, and a girdle of diamonds and stars of the same festoons are on her dress which is amazing. I wish we had a, a picture of that. Um, and I juxtaposed to uh, the portrait of Damer is a very well-known well portrait of uh, Eliza Farron uh, by Thomas Lawrence uh, in the Metropolitan Museum, which represents her uh, as a fashion icon. Um, many actresses were known for their fashion and their style um, and functioned in some ways like live mannequins. Thank you. And um, I think we, we, we have to wrap up, but I also wanted to, um, I think, uh, Judith, if you want to say a few words briefly about the fact, uh, it's interesting how uh, The Fashionable Friends was presented in a public theatre in 1802, and it actually flopped, um, shall we say. Uh, it was not well received and had to close after two or three nights. Um, how can we explain this, this Judith? Um, you're on mute. Every time. Um, so it, it's slightly hard to say why it flopped, but usually plays flop not, not necessarily because they weren't good or didn't hit the taste of the time, but because there was uh, opposition to them for some reason that often people set out to bring down a play. Um, the Fashionable Friends was uh, presented anonymously. It wasn't linked to Mary Berry at this time, but the, I think I remember there's the prologue or the epilogue was by a man, William Lamb, who was a member of a newly formed private theatrical society called the Picnic Society, which hired a theatre um, in London and was uh, performing long runs of, of plays during the season when the professional theatres were open. And this was cutting into the box office profits of the professional theatre. And here you see, it, this is one of James Gilray's wonderfully complex images, so I won't break it down too much, but I just want to say that in the center of the image, you find this lumpen 
um, Harlequin figure, which is an image of Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the politician, playwright and, and actor manager, bringing down the picnic society, blowing up the, the, the picnics. And because uh, Fashionable Friends was linked with the, with the, with the picnic society, uh, it, that might be one of the reasons why people deliberately brought it down, not because um, it had any notoriety or they're particularly targeting uh, Mary Berry. Because of the story itself. Thank you. Um, and I think to conclude, uh, I wanted to, you know, both The Mysterious Mother and The Fashionable Friends uh, somewhat fell into oblivion um, shortly after being written. But today, um, that's not the case anymore, is it? Um, because we've had this wonderful um, stage reading at the Yale Center for British Art, and there's, there's one for Fashionable Friends um, in the works. So do you want to say just a few words maybe um, about what the experience was and why it is important to have these, these stage readings and performances? Um, well, I'll say something about the Fashionable Friends performance, which unfortunately did not take place because it was uh, associated with Artful Nature, which didn't happen uh, because of the pandemic. But we are, are hoping to revive it. Um, these are images of the rehearsal. Um, and what we did, we had I had four really brilliant actors. And what we did was we adapted the play and made it into a kind of performance piece, which was a site-specific piece. Um, and we led uh, the audience uh, around different uh, places in the library and in the house connected to the library. Uh, even though in the 18th century, private theatricals were not necessarily movable, um, they were mostly in one room. Um, the idea of this was to kind of uh, introduce audiences to the idea of the permeable, permeable boundaries between performance and, um, and the house itself, um, and to have them feel really um, enlivened by the uh, interior spaces. And in one of the photos, you can actually see a portrait of Walpole looking down on the app um, it was a it was a really uh, exciting experience. Well, we, we look forward to the to the real to the actual performance to the final performance when we can have it. And Cindy, I'm just going to go back to the slides of the uh, Yale performance in 2018. Um, what was the significance of this experiment, shall we say? Right. So um, we, this was all part of a big 300th uh, year celebration of Walpole's birthday um, that went through a whole, through a whole academic year. Um, and we just had a whole sort of coterie of scholars in the Lewis that come through the Lewis Walpole Library Fellowship Program. Um, and we just kind of built up this enthusiasm around the play um, and a big commitment to, to try to stage it. Um, and, and sort of in defiance of, of Walpole's fear that it was a tragedy that could never appear on any stage. Um, and as our director, wonderful director, Misty Anderson says, but reader, we did it. <laughs> so, um, and I think it was really successful. We did abridge it to uh, 40 to 50 minutes um, for fear of uh, perhaps um, imposing on our audience too much. Um, David Worrell did the abridgment. Um, we, we staged it on the very modernist backdrop of the stage on, at the Yale Center for British Art. So we brought in um, projections and sound effects and music um, that one of Misty's students did for us and, and rented costumes from some really wonderful local um, theater companies. Um, and it was just a, it was a matter of sort of the scholarship, performance scholarship. Um, and uh, there is a wonderful um, mini conference that accompanied the performance. And I think um, Emmanuel is going to uh, put that in the yes, chat yes. so you can link to I'm it. Just going to it's the fourth yeah. volume of the proceedings that will come out from your press. I just want to say one little thing about the performance, which I, I had so much fun viewing, is that I mentioned the sort of pentimento effect of the 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 real people showing through the characters. And I believe the monks were played by theology students. And so you had that sort of joke that there they were playing these evil monks where they're actually kind of trainee ministers for the church. And I can tell you that the uh, the after show party was quite a lot of fun. I mean, you know, trainee, <laughs> trainee vicars know how to have a good time at the after show party. <laughs> They're a bit less gloomy than they used to be in Walpole's medieval times. Imagine medieval yeah. times. <laughs> Excellent. And I have to say, Georgina Locke did an amazing job of bringing to life the Countess of Narbonne. 
Um, so it is, she is wonderful. I watched it on YouTube and I've just popped the, um, all the links of many of the things we've mentioned into the chat. Now, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time for the Q&A, but um, if uh, I see there's a couple of questions in there. So if you'd like to, there's one that I think we can reply to very briefly. Was each production and play or play shown only once? I don't think that was necessarily the case. No, there, there's normally a run. Um, at the, on the professional stage, you were lucky if you had a run of, of more than three nights. So short runs were quite familiar, but usually private theatricals would run for a few nights. And the first, there might be some rehearsals open to friends beforehand. And the first night was very often performed to the servants, the local farm workers, and then there'd be a grand opening. And if you were lucky, you could get the Prince of Wales to come. Fantastic. Um, I think for the other couple of questions, we will try to respond to those via email. I have made a note of what they are. And you can always contact us on the London Art Week main contact uh, email address and we'll try to reply to everything. As I said, this uh, talk will also be on YouTube in due course. Um, and now I just want to thank all our speakers and our audience. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for this absolute marathon through private theatricals um, in and around Strawberry Hill in the 18th and early 19th century. And uh, for our audience, I'd just like to remind you that next Tuesday we have another uh, talk in our Art History in Focus series on medieval women as subject and makers of art. So we hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>